ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Lock and load. It's time for the gun rack with your hosts, Joey and Drew. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the gun rack, Sonoran Desert Institute School of Firearms Technology's official podcast. I am your co host, Drew Poplin. Uh, happy March, everyone. It is March 1st as of this recording which means winter is going to be hopefully soon on its way out get a little bit more sunshine. Uh, ironically, it's raining. It's cold and rainy right now, but um, we got to try to keep that spirit, that spring spirit alive. A lot to look forward to in the coming weeks. Uh, March Madness season. You know, I'm a North Carolina boy, so March Madness is it's almost like a religion here for a lot of people. College basketball is. But I was, you know, I was thinking as I was prepping this episode, maybe it'd be cool to do a bracket style episode with firearms. I don't know how we do that, uh, especially so close to our firearms draft, but uh, we'll uh, figure something out that may or may not happen. But anyway, happy March, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. As you can tell from the title, we are talking about the M. 1911 just going to do a short brief history on the firearm on this uh iconic piece of weaponry before we do that though let me tell you about sdi sonoran desert institute aka sdi is an online school that helps students learn the skills and techniques they'll need to be successful in the firearms and unmanned technology industries sdi is accredited by the distance education accrediting commission the deac and currently we offer three programs in firearms technology we offer the associate of science in firearms technology the certificate in firearms technology gunsmithing and finally our brand new offering the certificate in firearms technology handgun specialist program now if you want more information about any of those programs you can go to our website that's www.sdi.edu for more information now before we get into this just going to share uh, some of my sources and also say a prayer for me if you're listening i'm I'm like in between fighting this urge or my body's urge to start hiccuping, which is very inconvenient when you're trying to record a podcast. So uh, we're going to get through this, hopefully. But just wanted to share some of my sources for this. We actually did an article on John Moses Browning, who, spoiler alert, created the M1911. So, yeah, using that source, Forgotten Weapons. Uh, Falco holsters, Browning's website. Those are some of our chief sources for today. Now, let's start with the late 1800s, specifically the 1890s. So during the Moro Rebellion, which happened during the Philippine-American War, it was coming apparent to the U.S. that we needed a new type of handgun for our soldiers. Most of our soldiers were issued... Colt M1892 revolvers, which while double action, meaning the rate of fire was quicker than what it had been in the past with single action revolvers, it was severely lacking in stopping power. Basically, you know, they would use this weapon at close range and it wasn't stopping anyone. It was chambered in 38 long Colt. It was so underpowered, in fact, or at least for armed conflict, that the U.S. ended up reverting to the m 1873, which was a single action revolver, but it was chambered in, I want to say it was chambered in 45, and that ended up being more effective. So we got to work. We got to work. First, we needed to decide what caliber would be the most effective for us to use. So in 1904, you have the famous Thompson Lagarde pistol round effectiveness tests. Among the calibers tested were the 765 by 21 millimeter Parabellum, otherwise known as 30 Luger. You have the 9 by 19 millimeter Parabellum, the 38 Long Colt, the 38 ACP, uh, both blunt and hollow point, 45 a Colt, 476 Ely, and the cupped 455 Webley. You know, one of the guys that was doing this test, it was Colonel John T. Thompson, who may, maybe may who's maybe most famous for his creation of the Tommy gun. He ultimately 
recently concluded that the new pistol, quote, should not be of less than a 45 caliber, unquote. And his preference would be a semi-automatic pistol. Keep in mind that these tests ended up coming under a decent amount of criticism, but also got a decent amount of support. So I'd say ultimately history has like proven that test, at least at the time, correct. But that's a that's a different topic for another day. In any case, once they determined the caliber uh, that they intended to use, the government set up a series of trials between six firearms manufacturers to determine who would come out on top. Among these, you had DWM, Savage Arms, Noble, Webley, White Merrill, and of course, Colt. After three were eliminated pretty quickly, this left DWM, Savage Arms, and Colt remaining. And the gun that Colt submitted was the M1911. And that firearm, which would go on to achieve immortal status amongst firearms aficionados, you know, as we- we'll get into it was designed by one john moses browning a legend in his own right now let's talk a little bit about john moses browning and this is taken straight from the article that we have on our website john moses browning was born in ogden utah in 1855 the son of mormon pioneer and gunsmith john browning he was one of 10 children six boys and four girls john moses browning learned the gunsmithing trade from his father He struck out on his own in 1878 when he began to design a self-cocking single-shot rifle. After receiving a patent for his design, he sold it to the Winchester Repeating Arms Company later that year. That firearm would eventually be known as the Winchester Model 1885. And this began a long-running relationship between Browning and Winchester uh, that would spawn several more firearms. They varied greatly in terms of their designs, which included single-shot rifles, repeaters, and several different types of shotguns. Uh, One notable result of this relationship was the world's first pump-action shotgun. Officially dubbed the Winchester Model 1897, the weapon is better known by its nickname, the Trench Gun. Now, Browning and Winchester would eventually part ways in 1903. Uh, According to Forgotten Weapons, Thomas Bennett, head of Winchester at the time, wrote to his distributors and agents explaining what had happened. Uh, I'm going to read that now. I'm going to try to. Uh, And he has addressed his agents and distributors as missionaries and salesmen, interestingly enough. And this was written August 21st, 1903. Dear sir, to reply to a question put by one of our missionaries, We have written as follows, thinking that perhaps you might have the same questions asked. You send the matter as written for your information. Where it becomes worthwhile to talk about inventions, you can say as to the automatic that it is the invention of Thomas C. Johnson, who is one of our employees. Of course, the Winchester Company, as a company, cannot invent anything. The people who are employed for that purpose are the real inventors. For a number of years, it seemed best to us to employ the Browning Brothers. We bought everything which they invented, which had merit, whether we used it or not. It seemed to us at the end that they had become rather high-priced, and we let them go to Colts. They had got to feel that they were the only people who could invent guns, that our suggestions as to what was needed by the public were of no value, and that they were really the, quote, whole thing. Mr. John Browning was a very nice man. And we were sorry to part with him because he was in many respects a genius. His younger brother, Mr. Matthew Browning, was a more difficult proposition. We understand he was not the inventor, but that Mr. John Browning was the inventor. None of the things invented by them were made by us exactly as presented. They were all worked over by the people in our employ to get them into such shape that they could be manufactured successfully. For instance, the Model 1886 gun is more largely the invention of our Mr. Mason than it is of the Browning brothers. The Brownings have supplied us with the locking features only. We shall be perfectly able to get along without the Brownings, and shall probably be better off without them than with them. The 22 Automac is a sample. On the other hand, we do not believe they will get along as well without us as they did with us. There is room for both. We should not like to have you say anything that would look as though we were inimicable. 
But if there were any suggestion of their claiming that they are the whole thing and there is nothing left, the 22 automatic gun is our answer. And we shall, without a little while, have other answers of the same kind to such argument. Yours respectfully, Winchester Repeating Arms Company President. Now, if you want more information about this breakup, I encourage you to go watch the Forgotten Weapons video on this topic. Uh, he has a video titled Great Celebrity Breakups Winchester and John Browning that goes into a lot of detail about it. Long story short, I think, uh, <laughs> I think in retrospect, maybe Winchester uh, would have liked to have kept Browning on. But in any case, the dissolving of a business relationship with Winchester allowed for Browning to forge new relationships with different firearms manufacturers like FN and, of course, Colt. John Moses Browning had started designing what became the M1911 as early as the late 1890s. Based on the short recoil principle of operation, Browning designed a weapon that was a magazine-fed, single-action, semi-automatic pistol with both manual and grip safeties. Now, let's go back to those handgun trials now that we've kind of caught up. At this point, it was a two-horse race between Colt and Savage Arms, as they apparently were the only two of the three uh, that were remaining that submitted redesigns. And these trials between Savage and Colt, uh, they lasted from 1907 to 1911. At the end of 1910, the test makers, they designed a particular test between the two where each gun would fire 6,000 rounds of ammunition over two days. Mind you, this is just one single firearm, each shooting 6,000 rounds in that short period. So yeah, a pretty tough test. Interestingly enough, the test was actually attended by Browning himself. Now, when Colt's gun began to grow hot, uh, they basically just dunked it in water to cool it off and they continued on uh, at least reportedly, and the Colt gun passed with no reported malfunctions, while the Savage Arms design had 37. So as a result, Colt won the trials and the contract, and it was formally adopted by the Army on March 29th, 1911, when it was designated Model of 1911, which later in 1917 got changed to Model 1911, and then in the mid-20s, it became known as the M1911. The U.S. Navy and Marine Corps adopted the Brownie design pistol in 1913. Now, of course, if you've been involved in any sort of discussion around this firearm, you'll hear the expression that M19 was the handgun that won two world wars. Before we can talk about those world wars, though, it actually got its first taste of battle in Mexico in 1916 during the Pancho Villa expedition. But the next year, World War I would kick off. Now, history buffs among you know that the war had a great effect on the development of new technologies. Um, and to its credit, the M1911 performed quite well during the conflict and was used by famous soldiers to great effect, such as uh, we have Alvin York, Sergeant Alvin York, uh, and Lieutenant Frank Luke. Now, by 1924, it would end up receiving some needed exterior alterations. All interior stuff was kept the same. It was just exterior alterations. But these greatly helped its ergonomics. So now you have the new M1911A1, which consisted of a shorter trigger, uh, cutouts in the frame behind the trigger, an arched mainspring housing, a longer beaver tail uh, to help prevent hammer bite, a wider front sight, a shortened hammer spur, and a simplified grip checkering. Uh, and basically, this resulted in a firearm that was simpler and easier to operate, in particular for those that had smaller hands. Now, all in all, Browning's gun had passed its first massive test. He ended up, unfortunately, dying shortly after work. While he was at FN, he was working at a factory. He had a heart attack and died in 1926. Of course, Browning ended up designing other classic firearms during his time, such as the bar, a bunch of 30 caliber, 50 caliber machine guns, uh, and the Browning high power. Uh, and of course, today is recognized as a legend in the gunsmith community, as he should be. Now, the period between the World Wars saw the reputation of the 1911 grow, as it saw action during the Banana Wars, uh, as they were called. 
and it became well-liked domestically as well amongst law enforcement. During World War II, it once again performed quite well, sporting a new parkerized metal finish. How swanky. Ultimately, nearly 2 million M1911A1s were produced for the war, which is a lot. And, you know, that big of need meant that you needed to spread out the production. Amongst some of the manufacturers, you had Remington Rand, which produced 900,000 of the M1911A1s. Colt, which produced 400,000. The Ithaca Gun Company, which produced 400,000. Union Switch and Signal, which produced 50,000. Uh, and then Singer, which I'm not sure if you know what Singer is, but basically they're a sewing and embroidery. Like, they make sewing machines. By the way, if you have a Singer manufacturer 1911 from this period, just so you're aware, I'm sure you probably already know this, but just in case you don't, you have a super valuable handgun in your possession. So, um... Yeah, congratulations on never having to work again. That's awesome for you. <laughs> um, anyway, let's move on. Now, the 1911, of course, did well in World War II. It also see usage in Korea and Vietnam. In Korea, it particularly stood out, maybe even more so than it did during the World Wars, funny enough. By the 1970s, you start seeing Colt's 1911 being slowly phased out of its position as the go-to handgun for the U.S. Armed Forces. They were starting to look for something that was maybe a little bit lighter, had more capacity, and less recoil. So as time passed, newer guns would come out, some leaving just as quickly while others paved the way for the innovations we have today. However, it wasn't until 2023, so last year, that the 1911 was essentially completely phased out of military conflict. Although it does have some, I think there's some uh, competition shooting within the military, uh, I, I was reading up on this, according to some guys on Reddit. So you know, take that with a grain of salt. Apparently, they have like the competition shooting within the military, and you know you kind of still see 1911s pop up there. Now, the legacy of the M1911 can't really be debated. It was a marvelous firearm for its time, and its time lasted a long time. Yeah, just think about its legacy. It's difficult to say where firearms innovation would be today without it. And although, you know, it did ultimately get retired, I think it was 70s, 80s that it started getting phased out of the military, favor of Beretta. Um, of course, you saw the, you still see it today, the uh, 1911 style handguns that it kind of gave birth to. See it all the time, but we've talked about them plenty on the show. Um, so it's a, uh, remarkable legacy uh the m1911 has yeah it's just a very iconic firearm now if you love 1911s you might be stoked to hear that sdi offers a course called fte 211 1911 advanced armorer this course presents a comprehensive overview of 1911 style firearms where students will discuss the history, development, and practical applications of 1911 style firearms, including their parts, functionality, ammunition, troubleshooting, maintenance, and repair. Now, for the history portion, you might have a leg up since you listen to this podcast, but uh, during this course, we also go over site options, uh, we have a tuning guide, and give considerations for customizing the 1911. A build kit will be provided to the student to demonstrate the topics learned in this course. It is an elective option that is available for students enrolled in either the Associate of Science in Firearms Technology or the Certificate in Firearms Technology Gunsmithing programs. So you need to be enrolled in those programs to be able to take the elective. Students in both programs will now be able to choose from 1911 Advanced Armor, Modern Sporting Rifle, which is your AR-9, AR-10, AR-15s, Pump, shotgun armor and developing a business plan for their elective depending on their eligibility eligibility is based on the student's age and you know whatever state you're in whatever restrictions they have now if you want more information the place to go it's www.sdi.edu head over there you can find out more information and yeah uh i swear this wasn't just a <laughs> uh wasn't just a ploy to plug SDI's course, although, I mean, I, I honestly didn't think about that until 
uh, I was coming to the end. I'm like, how am I going to conclude this? So I'm like, oh, yeah. I've, yeah, we have a course. Um, so I thought it was a good way to tie it back into SDI. Uh, anyway, thank you guys so much. That is it for the show. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I can't really recall if we've done a history of a firearm on the podcast as before. If we did, it was before my time, I believe. So I thought it was a cool way to blend history and firearms all into one. Uh, let me know if you guys want to see something like this again. Maybe do one on the history of Glock or, you know, something like that. would be interesting. Anyway, from us at the gun rack, have fun, stay safe, and we will see you at the range. Sonoran Desert Institute is an online school accredited by the DEAC. It is headquartered at 1555 West University Drive in Tempe, Arizona. For more information about how you can craft your firearms future, visit sdi.edu.